Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for that. All right, well, we are in 1 Peter, still in chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 13 this morning. So this is our third sermon in the series, and I, f I finally have come up with a title for the series, if you care about that at all. Um, I'm, I'm calling this Guidance for the Sojourner, or we can't just call it 1 Peter. Um, but uh, anyway, we'll, we'll start in verse 13, and uh, I've titled this sermon, Called to Obedience. So we're going to look at the mindset for obedience and motivation for obedience. Uh, but I want to start off with just uh, some introductory comments um, as we uh, prepare to read, beginning in verse 13. We see, as, as, as we have worked our way through chapter 1, that Peter is... He's careful to not put the cart before the horse when it comes to our obedience, much like what I was talking with the children about in truth time. So I'm sure you know what the phrase, put the cart before the horse means, but I thought for good measure, I'd just give, give a few examples, all right? So, so have you ever uh, been in the kitchen and you start uh, putting something together, you wanna make a meal, you wanna bake a cake or something, you get ahead of yourself and you start, uh, you start to make this uh, meal or this cake or whatever it is before you check to see if you have all the ingredients. Right? That might be a good example of putting the cart before the horse. You got to make sure you have all the ingredients first, right? Or uh, if, let's say you invest your hard-earned money into some business endeavor before doing the proper research. Well, that might be putting the cart before the horse. Here's a really good one. Uh, young ladies, if you make reservations for your wedding venue before your boyfriend actually proposes, that's putting the cart before the horse, right? So we don't want to do that. Now, I think, I think that there is a natural tendency for people to put the cart before the horse when it comes to our obedience to God. That is, we, we have this tendency to think, or at least um, many people do, have this tendency to think that, okay, if I obey, as long as I do all these things, then God will love me, then I will be saved. Rather than thinking, and this is the reality, the reality is that because we are saved, that's what should spur us on to do good works, right? So, so we put our trust in Jesus, recognizing that we can't obey God fully, um, and so we're saved by faith, not by works, we're saved by faith, but then that salvation actually does spur us on to good works. So it's justification and then sanctification, right? We have to get the order right. And so uh, Peter, I think, is careful to do that here in, in this letter. And so he begins uh, in chapter 1, the very beginning. Our first sermon was uh, titled Sovereignly Saved and Secure. And so we saw that he uh, was rejoicing in the salvation that we have in Christ. And then he moves on to focus on the faith by which we are saved. Uh, so we talked about that in our last sermon, uh, this faith that is tested by, by, tri by, by fire and, and so on. And, uh, and then he goes on again, though, in, in verses 10 through 12, to once again, uh, just, just to rejoice in this great salvation that we have. And then finally, in verse 13, we have the therefore. Right? When you see a therefore, it's important. Right? You've got to know what the therefore is there for. And, 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 so, and so there's this transition now into this call to obedience, right? So after, after focusing in on and celebrating our great salvation in Christ, then he brings us to obedience. And so in doing this, Peter, he reinforces the order of salvation. He helps us to see that obedience to God is not just merely a duty, but it is a delight, right? It's a delight whenever it is rooted in gratitude for salvation. And so uh, we have to keep that in mind. And so with those introductory comments, uh, let's begin now in verse 13. I'd like you to stand with me in honor of reading God's word. We're going to read uh, verses 13 through 25. Therefore, preparing your minds for action, and being sober-minded, sober set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. 
knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, that like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Verse 20, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you so much for this good news that we have received through your word. We have received through faith. Lord, we pray that, um, that we will um, be spurred on to obedience, sanctification. Lord, help us. As we look at this passage this morning, help us to see the mindset for obedience, the motivation for obedience, and I pray that we will respond. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So we see in this passage, we see that the proper response to our salvation is obedience. Let me just read a couple places where this word obedience appears. Verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. And he goes on. Uh, we also see in verse 22, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, love one another. So, um, and, and then we'll, we'll see as, as, we, as we look closer at this passage that there are many commands. In fact, there are three commands or imperatives that, uh, that have to do with our obedience, okay? Um, I wanna begin though with talking about the mindset for obedience. So talk about the mindset for obedience and then the motivation for obedience. So the mindset for obedience, uh, we see this just in, in the very first verse, in verse 13, okay? So in verse 13, and, and, and this, this point's going to be much more brief than the second. In verse 13 we see, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right, so let's just look at a couple of these phrases. Uh, first is preparing your minds for action. Um, there's actually a much more literal rending, rendering of this, uh, which is gird, girding the loins of your mind for action. Girding the loins of your mind. Well, maybe uh, that, that's kind of confusing. Maybe that's why we have it written, preparing your minds for action. Does anybody, anybody's translation actually have the girding your loins? Okay, what do you have? Um, the verse. Well, no, I, what translation is it? Um, New King James. Okay, all right. Sorry to put you on the spot there. But yeah, yeah, so, so, so that, that, is, that is the literal wording of it. Girding the loins of your mind for action which is preparing your mind for action, but I want to talk to you a little bit about what girding your loins is. So I have an illustration up here, put it up there for me, Jane Ann. All right, this, uh, this comes from a website called The Art of Manliness. You should check it out. It's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of a cool website. All right, but this, this shows, because there are actually many places in the scripture where it talks about girding your loins, okay? And so, and so this was a practice, you know, back then when they didn't have pants, they wear robes like that. And if you're going to go into battle or if you need to run, if you need to, you know, uh, do something active, you've got to gird up your loins. So you see a step-by-step -step thing here, right? So, so first you, uh, you, you, you pull up your dress or, <laughs> or your, uh, your robe, whatever you want to call it. You bunch it up at the front and then you pull it behind and then you have the two, uh, the two ends that you bring around and you tie together, right? That's how to gird your loins. All right, and look now he's now he's ready for battle. You can see him there with the sword. So, uh, so, so we need to gird the loins of our mind for action. We need to prepare our minds for action. And understand, this is a call to battle, right? A call, our call to obedience is a call to battle, right? We have we have to fight for obedience. We have to fight for holiness, right? We're fighting against the flesh. We're fighting against the devil. We're fighting against the world. Um, 
we, we are called to prepare for action, to gird the loins of our mind for action. Right, so preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, right? so, so, uh, so we have to be thinking clearly, uh, we have to be self-controlled, we have to be intentional. Um, so doing these things, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so that's, that's, that's the key phrase there. That's, that's what those uh, um, phrases beforehand are, are leading up to, right? Preparing your mind, being sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we have to set our, so if we want to have a mindset for obedience. We want to be ready to obey. It starts with setting our mind on the hope, on the, or set, setting, sorry, setting our hope fully on the grace that will be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ, right? Suffice it to say that we have to have an intentional gospel mindset, right? Do you, are you intentional about that? Are you intentional about having a, a, a mentality that is centered on the gospel? Right? We have, to be intentional means that we're actually doing some intentional things in order to prepare our minds in this way. So, so here's my challenge to you. Um, we, we, we want to fill our minds with things that make us um, contemplate the, the, the glories of the gospel, right? We, we, we want to fill our lives with things that, that stir our affections for Jesus. So, you know, maybe it's the music that you listen to, the things that you read, whatever you watch. Um, you know, there, there are so many things throughout our day that that focus our minds, and it can focus your mind on one thing or another. And so the challenge is uh, for you to prepare your mind for battle, all right? To, um, to set your hope on the grace of Jesus Christ, to be sober-minded, to be self-controlled, to be intentional. Think, think about um, the gospel, and you've got to do that, right? Because, because again, um, obedience is to flow from that, right? Uh, obedience doesn't lead to the gospel. The go- it, it flows from the gospel. It flows from a mindset um, that is a mind that is set on the gospel. So, so we have to have a mindset for obedience. So you see in this text that obedience to God is the overflow of such a mindset. Right? Obedience to God is the overflow of such a mindset. All right, so I said that first point will be short. We're going to move on to the second now, and we'll spend some more time on it. So that's motivation for obedience. So verse 14, he begins, as obedient children, and then he goes on to give um, different commands, different imperatives. And so there, there are actually three imperatives. Uh, now, there, there's more than just these imperatives. We, um, we have uh, other phrases that, that uh, go before them and follow them, but, but three imperatives, three commands. Okay? And that is to be holy in all your conduct, to conduct yourselves with fear, and to love one another. Right? Um, those are the three commands uh, from verse 14 on through the end of the chapter. Be holy in all your conduct, conduct yourselves with fear, and love one another. All of these do have to do with obedience. All right, and so, so what we're going to do this morning is, um, rather than focusing on these commands, I want to focus on the motivation that is given for following these commands, because, uh, because we see um, uh, an emphasis on that in this, in this passage, uh, because, as I said, there's, there's much more than just these simple commands. Uh, we have reasons and motivations that are attached to them, and so we might say a few things about uh, the commands themselves as we look at the motivations attached to them. But again, we're going to focus on uh, the motivation. So um, before we do that, just a quick note. Oftentimes, and I've already kind of done this, oftentimes when, when, when someone gives a, a motivation for obedience, they said, okay, well, the motivation should be gratitude for God's grace, right? Uh, out, of, out of our gratitude for the gospel, we, we obey. So I've kind of already said that, and I think that that kind of fits with, with what we were just talking about with the mindset for obedience. So I think that certainly is true that um, our obedience is to flow from a gratitude for God's grace. That that is, in fact, a motivation. But that's not one of the explicit motivations that's mentioned here. Okay, 
So, so I listed that there were three commands given. There are four explicit motivations that are given in this passage, which we'll focus on. Okay, so those those three commands again, they can be kind of be summed up: obey God, right? They all have to do with our obedience. But what are the motivations? So the first motivation is to be like God. Look at verses 15 through 16. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. So that's that's the command right there. Right? That's that first command: be holy in our conduct. But here comes the motivation: since it is written. You shall be holy, for I am holy. You shall be holy, for I am holy. All right, that's the motivation. We want to be like God, right? That makes sense. Um, doesn't it just tug at your heartstrings when children seek to imitate their parents? Uh, especially some of, well, you know, even those of you who had young ones many, many, many years ago, I'm sure you can remember those times when, when your children sought to imitate you. Um, you know, toddler slipping on his dad's shoes. That's like the most cliche thing in the world, right? I mean, every, every kid does that. But I'll tell you what, whenever, uh, whenever our first one, Caleb, whenever he stepped into my shoes one day, I thought, I thought it must have been the first time it happened in human history. I thought it was, it, 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 just, it just tugged at my heartstrings. It was, it was so um, moving to see, oh, he wants to be like his dad. He's, he's, he's staying in his dad's shoes. It's, it, it's moving to see that. And, and uh, uh, I think about uh, a song that uh, during the same time um, in our lives when we had, uh, had our first child, hear a song on the radio. Maybe you've heard this if, if you'll admit to listen to country uh, music every once in a while. Um, I've been watching you, Dad ain't that cool. I'm your buckaroo, I wanna be like you. Anybody wanna admit to hearing that song? Um, <laughs> Eat all my food and grow as tall as you are. We like fixing things and holding mama's hands. Yeah, we're just like, hey, ain't we dad? I want to do everything you do. I've been watching you. I remember I heard that song and I'm like tearing up, you know. Um, you know we, 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 we delight in our children wanting to be like us. Well, understand, God is more delighted than you will ever know whenever you seek to imitate him. Right? God delights in us wanting to be like him. Be holy, for I am holy. Right? God wants us to imitate him. It shows that we hold him in high regard, and it shows us to be his obedient children. Right? As obedient children, he says, do these things. Don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Right, so that's the first, first motivation for obedience that we see in this passage is to be like God. We want to be like our father. We want to be like our dad. The second one is because he is a righteous judge. Right? So we see in this passage that God is our father, but we also see that he is a righteous judge. Right? Verse 17, if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. So, uh, so we see he's not only father, but he is a righteous judge. And, uh, and as you probably noticed, this is connected with the command to conduct yourselves with fear. Right? So why should we conduct ourselves with fear? Why should we be obedient? Well, because God is a judge who judges impartially according to each one's deeds. This is something that maybe we don't think about a whole lot because, because we're, we're right to recognize, we're right to appreciate, to praise God for the fact that those of us who are in Christ, that we will be free from God's punishment in the last day, right? So, so in the sense of, of having judgment in the form of punishment, right, we're free from that. Um, Jesus paid the price for our sins, but we might throw the baby out with the bathwater and fail to recognize that we all will have to give an account before the Lord on the day of judgment. And that should bring about some fear and reverence, shouldn't it, right? We, sh we, should, we should conduct ourselves with fear because we recognize that, because we recognize that God judges, that he is a judge. Jesus said, Matthew 12, 36, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. Well, that might make you pay more attention to what you say, right? 
you're going to have to give an account. Now, again, right, it's paid for. It's paid for on the cross. Um, but everyone's going to have to give, give an account for every careless word spoken. 2 Corinthians 5.10. Paul writing to believers, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Okay? So, so, so there, and there's some mystery to this. Right? We talk about rewards in heaven, right? The Bible has a lot to say about that, but there's, there's some mystery to that. Like, like how, how is that going to be manifested? And, and, and um, we, we could ask all kinds of questions. But, uh, but the fact is that God is still judge, and, and, uh, and we will have to give an account. So we, again, look at verse 17. If you, so he, this, this, is, this is the motivation, right? If you call him as father who judges, if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Okay? So that's the second motivation. We recognize that we're going to have to give an account before God. In fact, as a pastor, you know, the scripture tells me that as a pastor, that I'm going to have to give an account for all of you. That's a scary thing, right? Uh, it, 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 at least I'm going to have to give an account in, in how I minister to you as, as your pastor. And so, and so we, uh, um, we have that as a motivation for, for holiness, for obedience, for conducting ourselves with fear. So that's the second one. Number three. A third motivation for obedience is because you have been ransomed. Verses 18 through 19. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So this is also connected with the command to conduct yourselves with fear, right? That command, conduct yourselves with fear, is kind of sandwiched in between um, these two motivations. So the language of this, that is the language of us being ransomed, it indicates two things. To be ransomed means that we've been set free, right? We've been set free. Set free from what? Well, we've been set free from sin. A lot of times we, we, think of, we think of our salvation, we think of Jesus' death on the cross as simply forgiving us of our sins. Of course, that's huge, right? Our sins are forgiven. That's something to celebrate. But that's not all of the gospel. Um, we're not only forgiven from our sins, but we're delivered from our sins, right? Now, now there's a process. It's this process of sanctification that we always talk about, and it leads up to our glorification when we are fully and finally released from all sin. But, uh, but, but even now, we are being free from sin. We are, in a sense, once and for all, free from sin, right? You have died to sin, Paul says. And so, so we have been ransomed. We've been ransomed from sin. And, uh, and so that's motivation for obedience, isn't it? We remind you, know, Paul says in the same passage, he says, you know, you've died to sin. Later on, he says, he says, consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So we have to consider ourselves dead to sin. We have to consider ourselves free, ransomed from sin, and say, okay, because of that, because I am ransomed, I'm going to live in obedience. So that's one thing that this ransom language points to, that we're set free. But also, uh, it also uh, reveals to us that we were purchased at a great cost, right? If, if, uh, if someone gives a ransom, that means that, you know, if we think of it in, in the way we typically think of it in modern, uh, modern day, we, we think of, you know, someone paying money to, to ransom somebody, right? Well, that's, that's in effect, it's the same thing. Jesus paid his life. He shed his blood so that we could be free. There was a great cost, and it was the blood of Jesus. As the passage goes on to say, right, with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, we could even draw a parallel here to the freedom purchased by our military. I actually hesitate to do that, though, because um, there are, first of all, there are some significant different differences, right? A lot of times we, uh, and, and, and it's natural for us to think of, okay, um, you know, 
our military, they, they give their lives for us, and so now we're free here in the United States of America. Jesus gave his life for us, now that we're free. There's somewhat of a parallel there, but there are also, of course, many differences. So that's, that gives me one hesitation to make the comparison. Another, another hesitation, though, is that sometimes um, many Christians are more moved by the national anthem than they are by Jesus paid it all. Isn't that a shame, right? Um, sometimes you can look it into a crowd. You, you, you see, you see a, a Christian singing the national anthem and, and, and tearing up. But when you sing Jesus paid it all, nothing. I said, that's a big problem, right? It's a big, big problem. Um, our freedom that was purchased through Jesus Christ is incomparable. Um, you, you can't compare it to anything. And we've got to have an appreciation of it. No doubt a realization and appreciation for what has been accomplished for us through the cross, it will spur us on to obedience, right? Um, the, the, the more we, we contemplate and think of the price that Jesus paid for our sin, and, and that goes hand in hand with the depth of our sin, right? The greater our sin, the greater the price. The greater the price paid indicates the greater our sin. Um, and so we've got, to realize, we've got to recognize both ends of that, right? That we are great, great sinners, and therefore we're in need of a great, great Savior. And so Jesus, he suffered excruciating pain, um, but, but beyond that, um, he endured the wrath of God for us, right? He took on the punishment of our sins, and... And when we recognize the price that was paid, when we recognize what we're really freed from, we recognize the, the bondage of sin and, and, and what, what our new life in Christ can be and what it will be for eternity, um, that's going to spur us on to obedience. So again, I, I pointed to Romans 6 where Paul says, you died to sin, how can you live in it any longer? Well, here he's saying, you've been ransomed from sin. How can you live in it any longer? How can you live in sin? How can you not follow in obedience, having been ransomed by the blood of Jesus. So that's the third motivation. So the fourth and final motivation for obedience is because you've been born again. So let's skip down to verse 22. Verses 20 and 21, they're very rich, and we actually commented on those um, a couple weeks ago, and we'll come back to them at the close of the sermon. But look at verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. So there, that's that third command, love one another, right? Which we're summing all these up is obey, right? That is the essence of obedience, to love God and to love others, right? That's, that's keeping, that's what it is to keep God's commands. So we love one another, but here's the motivation, verse 23. Since you have been born again, not of imperishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. If you've been born again, you're a new person, a new creation. And how wonderful that is. You know, unfortunately, I think uh, the phrase born again has probably lost a lot of meaning in our current cultural context. Um, maybe it's kind of come, become cliche, kind of like evangelical, right? Evangelical is probably thought more of as a voting demographic than it is uh, for what it originally was meant to mean. Maybe the same thing for born again. It always wasn't the case, though, with this phrase born again. It wasn't, all, it wasn't uh, always all so common. Um, in fact, you know, this is before I was born, but uh, maybe some of you will remember um, Jimmy Carter and his campaign. Anybody remember, uh, uh, this, this is what I read at least, that in Jimmy Carter's uh, presidential campaign, he spoke of himself as a born-again Christian, and everybody was scratching their heads like, what, what does that mean? What does born-again mean? It was, it was kind of, it, it, was, it, was, it was a new phrase in public discourse, right? And, and so, um, so people began to uh, um, call evangelical Christians born-again Christians, and, uh, and I'm sure it carried a lot more weight uh, then than it does now, because as with many things, when, when a word is used and used and used and used, it kind of loses its meaning. It becomes cliche, uh, at least in people's minds. So uh, um, being born again, though, it's a, it's a really radical thing. It's radical. It's, it's supernatural. Um, I mean, go back to Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus. His mind was blown by this idea of being born again. Right? People's minds aren't blown by it anymore because it's just a common 
word, a common phrase that's used. We need our minds to be blown by it, right? This, this supernatural new birth by the Holy Spirit that results in a new person, a new creation, right? We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And so because we're born again, because we're a new person, because we're a new creation, it flows that we're going to obey, right? The old, the old me, who was dead in sin, lived in sin, but now I've been born again, right? And, and uh, well, we'll go back to verse 3 here in a minute. But I've, I've, been, I've been born again, and so I'm a new person. I'm a new creation, and so that's a motivation to obey. Let's go back to verse 3, because verse 3... Um, speaks of our being born again. Remember, blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, let me stop there for a moment. Um, we're going to transition now into our closing. And I'm going to read verse 4 here. In, in a moment, and, and verse 4 is, is going to begin a theme that I want to trace through um, through the end of this chapter uh, as we close. Sorry, verse 4. So in verse 4, he says, We've been born again to what? To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So here's the thought that I want to close on. Um, and we'll, I want to point this out here in a few more places. We see in this first chapter that, that Peter, again and again, he, he focuses on the eternal. There's an emphasis on the eternal. And that's important for us. It's kind of a closing thought. This is important for us as we're thinking about obedience, uh, our mindset for obedience, our motivation for obedience. Uh, we have to keep in mind that, that we're dealing with things of eternal significance, and, and, and that's going to make a difference, and that's going to help us in our obedience. And so we see it first here in verse 4, right? Uh, we're born again to this inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, right? So we have this uh, eternality, right? We see it in verse 4. Um, if you look forward on to verse 7, in verse 7, we see that he compares genuine faith, or sorry, he contrasts genuine faith with gold, with which perishes. Remember, we talked about that just in our last sermon. Um, one thing that distinguishes our faith, that is genuine faith, from gold, is that gold perishes. Our faith is not. Our faith perseveres. It's eternal, right? So our inheritance is eternal. Uh, genuine faith is eternal. What else? Well, in our text this morning, we see it in two places. Uh, we see in verses 18 through 20. That the blood of Jesus is likewise contrasted with silver and gold, right? So our faith is contrasted with gold, and the blood of Jesus is contrasted with silver and gold. Again, pointing out that it is eternal, unlike silver and gold. Even though silver and gold are very, very precious, they are not eternal. So uh, let me just read verses 18 through 20 again. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, right? So you weren't ransomed with something that's perishable, like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And in these two wonderful verses, 20 and 21, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. So we see that, indeed, salvation um, through Christ's sacrificial death, it stretches not only forever into the future, but also backwards to before the foundation of the world, right? Jesus, uh, this sacrifice for our sins was foreknown before the foundation of the world. So again, we have this um, eternal perspective. And then finally, uh, we'll close with verses 23 through 25. So we're told to love one another earnestly from pure heart. Verse 23, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. All flesh is like grass. Even we, we ourselves are perishable. 
and its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. The word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. That is the gospel. That the gospel remains forever. All right? These things are eternal. And so the point is that as Christians, we are invested into eternal matters, right? This is serious business. So as we talk about the mindset for obedience, motivations for obedience, in the backdrop we have, we have um, this recognition of the fact that, hey, this, this is of eternal significance. And so this, alongside everything else that we've discussed this morning, is key in both our mindset and our motivation for obedience. And so may we consider these things and obey. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these insights that uh, may be fresh insights to many of us on good motivations for us to obey, the mindset that we must have in order to obey. And so, Lord, help us, help us to um, to have that mindset, help us to respond to these motivations, for us to um, consider these things and obey, uh, for us to be obedient servants, not out of mere duty, but uh, out of delight, Lord. Help us to delight in obeying your commands. And we want to bring all glory and honor to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, what would you stand as we have our time of invitation? This is a time to respond to God's word. Um, whether that be where you are, just singing along and praying.